I would uh, like to introduce the uh, person who's gonna lead the presentation, get us started. I'm happy to turn things over to Dr. Jean-Luc Cartran, who managed the project and represents Daniel B. Stevens and Associates. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sandra. On uh, behalf of our entire team, uh, thank you for attending this public meeting and thank you for your interest in the topic of wildlife corridors and the recently released draft wildlife corridors action plan. We've included a lot of analyses and information in the action plan, uh, which was prepared for all of New Mexico. The action plan identifies and prioritizes wildlife vehicle collision hotspots and wildlife corridors, proposes concrete engineering solutions for reducing wildlife vehicle conflicts and enhancing habitat connectivity. And it also presents a detailed cost benefit analysis for all proposed solutions. Uh, the scope and the, and the goals of the action plan required us assembling a multidisciplinary team of road ecologists, wildlife biologists, transportation experts, modelers, GIS specialists, and engineers. They're all listed on uh, this slide here. And, um, but in addition to our team members, we also benefited from the assistance of a number of researchers, NGOs, government agencies, and, and tribes. These collaborators are all named at the beginning of the action plan, but we'd like to thank them all again here. As well as the New Mexico Department of Transportation, NMDOT, which funded the project starting in the fall of 2019, when Daniel Lee Stevenson Associates was contracted by NMDOT to develop the plan. So we don't have time to look at everything that's in the action plan, but here's what we'd like to cover with our presentation tonight. We'll go briefly over the history of road mitigation projects already implemented in New Mexico or in the process of being implemented in the state. We'll present the Wildlife Corridors Act passed in early 2019, without which the action plan would not have been developed. We'll say a few words about the methodology we employed to arrive at the top 11 recommended projects. Uh, that is the top five wildlife vehicle collision hotspots and the top six wildlife corridors. Next, we'll present um, each of those priority areas and we'll conclude with a few remarks on what are likely to be the next steps. Um, and we know there's a lot of interest from everyone as to that uh, next step. As we go through the presentation, Dr. Patricia Kramer, our team's top expert in the field of road ecology, Mark Watson of the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish, Matt Haberlin of NMDOT, and I will pass the baton to each other as we present the slides. So up first is Mark Watson for the history of mitigation projects. Mark. Thank you, Jean-Luc, and good evening, everybody. My name is Mark Watson. I'm the Terrestrial Habitat Specialist with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish in Santa Fe, and I'm the lead, uh, the department lead for Wildlife Corridors Act implementation. And I'm unfortunately having some internet uh, connectivity issues, so hopefully I can get through this uh, without it uh, timing out on me. But I'm gonna provide a, a real brief history of wildlife vehicle collision mitigation projects in New Mexico. Um, more details on these projects can be found in Appendix A of the draft action. 10 wildlife vehicle collision mitigation projects completed in the state. They're identified on this map by the green stars. And most, if not all of these projects, most of these projects have been basically the result of several legislative memorials and driver safety concerns. Um, and before passage of the Wildlife Corridors Act, there was really no clear process for how to propose and implement projects. Next slide, please. 
So the first wildlife vehicle collision mitigation project implemented in New Mexico by New Mexico Department of Transportation was on US 550 between Aztec and the Colorado border, where about three miles of eight foot woven wire game fence was installed and three small corrugated metal culverts like you see here were upsized to large concrete box culverts. Next slide, please. And those, all three of those large box culverts have had um, hundred passages documented through them. Next slide, please. Our flagship project in New Mexico, Wildlife Vehicle Collision Mitigation Project, some of you might be knowledgeable about, was the Tijeras Canyon Safe Passage Project on I-40 and Old Route 66, New Mexico Highway 333, east of Albuquerque. Uh, that was completed in 2007. And this project was unique in that it was the only project that's been completed so far that was really um, motivated and driven by a uh, non-governmental organization, the Tijeras Canyon Safe Passage Coalition. And that might be a good model for how to implement future projects. And also just as a side note, New Mexico Department of Game and Fish has a Pittman-Robertson grant through the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Act to replace the non-functional animal detection system at our at-grade crosswalk, which is in the photo here. Need to try and uh, replace that non-functional animal detection system. Next slide, please. Next slide. There we go. And last but certainly not least, um, our most current project that's still being constructed is along I-25 between Raton and the Colorado border where New Mexico Department of Transportation is installing the state's first arch culvert uh, wildlife dedicated underpass that has a natural dirt substrate. And we hope that mule deer and elk will readily use this arch culvert as well as other critters to keep them off the highway. And that project hopefully will be completed this year. And with that, I'll pass it over to Matt. Thank you for that, Mark. Yes, my name is Matt Haverland. I am the wildlife coordinator for the DOT and the uh, DOT's lead on this effort. So this entire effort was initiated by the creation of the uh, New Mexico Wildlife Corridors Act, which was uh, signed into law in 2019 by Governor Ron Grisham. Uh, the act tasked NMDOT and Game of Fish to develop a wildlife corridors action plan that identifies highway segments that pose a risk to wildlife movement and to the traveling public. Uh, this Wildlife Corridors Act tasked identifying these issues by combining wildlife vehicle collision data with ecological data as well. Now, the purpose of the Wildlife Corridors Action Plan was to identify wildlife linkages across the state for large mammals and species of concern, to identify highway segments where we can provide motors, uh, promote motor safety and wildlife connectivity, and to encourage the DOT and Game of Fish to use the best available science, uh, collaborate with tribal governments, non-government organizations, federal land management agencies, private landowners, and the public to identify mitigation action and identify areas of concern. Next slide, please. Uh, the Wildlife Forest Act was pretty specific in uh, the focal species for the Wildlife Corridors Action Plan. Uh, these uh, species defined in the act uh, are six large mammals, including the black bear, uh, bighorn sheep, mountain lion, a deer, pronghorn antelope, and elk. Next slide, please. Now, uh, about one third of the state is public land. However, a lot of our uh, top priority project areas do uh, have quite a su substantial amount of private land as well. The Wildlife Corridors Action Plan is very specific that private landowners do not have to participate if they don't want to. But the, the DOT and you know, the, the project action team uh, does encourage participation in these projects because uh, it could der derive a lot of uh, benefits for private landowners 
including uh, different types of easements or just having more animals passing through the property for their enjoyment. Uh, private landowner cooperation is paramount to the success of these mitigation projects. With that, I'll pass it on to Patty. Hello, I'm Patricia or Patty Kramer. I was the principal investigator of the team. And I just want to say that I'm very proud of all our members, everyone working together as a long list of people that worked for over two years to bring this to you. Um, four of us have lost a parent or our spouse's parent in this process this two years. So it's been hard on some of us. So I thank you for your patience and waiting for this plan to come out, but we are very proud to bring it to you. So we're dedicating the plan and the slideshow to them. Um, we've got seven tasks that we did for the action plan that are directly from the act. And we will go through each of them and tell you basically the methods on how we got to the point where we were able to give you the top wildlife corridors and crash hotspots. So with that, we will progress to the next slide. Task one was data gathering, and there was a lot of information that we brought together. The New Mexico DOT's information on roads, how you know um, the traffic volume, et cetera, was, was, and of course the crashes, what were all brought together. We looked at five years of crash data typically for what species of animal was involved. My apologies. And um, the map that you see there on the lower right is the crashes with deer, mule deer and white-tailed deer throughout the state, solely on New Mexico DOT roads. And that's one thing we do wanna stress too, is that in any state, the DOTs only administer about one quarter of all the roads in the state. So that, that shows you right there where the New Mexico DOT is responsible for basically. Our, our partners in tribes and academic areas were very, um, very instrumental in giving us data and information about where different species of animal are out there and nonprofit organizations and modeling from prior uh, researchers and uh, the public as well. So we, we brought in a lot of information, which we'll tell you more about next. Uh, thank you, Patty. Matt already mentioned the six large mammals identified by or in the Wildlife Corridors Act. Um, the act also stipulates the need to develop a list of species of concern. And um, that's one of the um, early steps that we went through with uh, in collaboration with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. We generated a, a list of 20 species of concern. And so we used three main criteria to develop that list. Um, the species of concern are those that um, pose a particular risk to the traveling public in New Mexico, that's one criterion, or experience mortality from collisions with road traffic to the degree, and this is important, to the degree that it reduces or potentially reduces population levels or population densities of that species in the state and or three um, species that avoid roads to the extent that although mortality might not be an issue, an issue roads represent important habitat connectivity barriers. Our list of uh, species of concern was developed with input from top expert mammologists and herpetologists in New Mexico and based on a thorough review of the scientific literature. Um, we've already received some comments on, on uh, our choice of species of concern, and um, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have regarding that topic at the end of the presentation. Um, but one word about distribution maps. Um, there's a distribution map for each and every species of concern in the action plan, and we relied on those distribution maps to tell us whether any given species was present in a potential priority area and thus could benefit from the installation of an overpass, an underpass, or both. And the flip side of that is that 
the distribution maps told us uh, whether a priority area under, well, told us that the priority area under consideration was that much more important um, because it had um, the, the species of concern. And as a result, it received additional points in the scoring system. Some of the distribution maps, those on carnivores, are based on um, a book that have been editing for 10 years with um, Dr. Jennifer Fry at NMSU, uh, The Wild Carnivores of New Mexico, uh, which should be published in the spring of 2023 by UNM Press. And um, the book also includes in one of the chapters, uh, future climate projections and associated shifts in the distribution of main ecosystem boundaries, uh, all based on collaboration with uh, Dr. Gussler, uh, just retired from UNN, and Dr. Jack, Jack Tripka uh, with, a, with the US Forest Service. Um, so there's a lot um, about these, these maps that we could talk about, but the, the main message I think tonight is that as a response to climatic and vegetational changes, it is likely that animal movements will increase. Um, and that is why in the future, the, the problem of wildlife equal conflicts will likely go up rather than down, at least in the foreseeable future, if we don't do anything. Patty, back to you. All right. Well, we'll be telling you now um, a little bit more about how we selected the different sites that we thought were the best place to recommend where mitigation will occur. Two different processes ran parallel to one another. The first one on your left is the hotspot modeling of the crash data. And if you look and see, you'll see little red squiggles on the map and we'll tell you more about them. Don't worry about that, they'll be coming up. And uh, next slide, what we did to get to that point is we use um, ArcGIS uh, tool called Optimized Hotspot Analysis. Um, and we used it to show where the areas were where the greatest concentration was of crashes per mile per year. Tell you more about that when we get you to the details. On the right, if you look at different color squiggles on that slide, side of the slide, that is our optimized hotspot, excuse me, our, our, our um, corridor modeling. And it looked at each of the six focal species individually and then combined. So you'll look at the areas in your Santa Fe and Taos, um, in that general area in the mountains, there was a lot of activity of color there um, where the model said that was a very important place. Next slide. The modeling tool was called Unicore, and it looked at many uh, very complex data layers, and we'll tell you more about that next. So I'll use the, the Cougar as, as an example of how the modeling occurred for wildlife corridors. Um, on the left-hand side of the slide is a habitat suitability for the species, and um, the the hot colors tend to represent um, more suitable habitats. And basically the, the cougar is associated with rugged, rugged topography and uh, denser, taller vegetation as um, ambush cover primarily. On the right hand side is um, a resistance layer map, which um, shows uh, where you have the darker blue uh, where resistance to movements might be higher for the, for the species. What you do once you have a resistance layer is you can, um, you can create a virtual landscape that's pixelated and you can put virtual animals on your pixelated landscape. Um, if you have estimates of densities that are uh, for certain areas. You can even populate your landscape in proportion to those estimates. Um, next, you let your virtual animals uh, move around from one pixel to the next in what is called the least cost path analysis. And you arrive at uh, the map that's in the middle, which um, shows corridors intersecting roads. All right. Well, let's, let's talk more about the other factors that came into selecting these top places. Where the wildlife vehicle collision hotspots, we didn't wanna just look at crashes per mile. We looked at transportation factors like um, 
uh, traffic volume, as mentioned earlier, and the severity of the crashes. We looked at wildlife factors and had a whole list of species we wanted to see that if they were there, those species of special concern. And when we quantified all those top 10 hotspots based on a whole long matrix of, of values, we came up with a different ranking than just the crashes per mile. On the right there, the corridors were not based solely on that modeling. We want to make that clear, the modeling informed other decisions we made. So for instance, Interior Secretary Order 3362 told states to look at their um, corridors for ungulates and New Mexico Game and Fish came up with areas they said were important in reference to that um, order. We also had collar data from New Mexico Game and Fish, from the tribes, from uh, uh, academic partners, um, and other information that we brought in. Our nonprofit partners gave us maps, photos, um, letters in support of various corridors. And so with all that information, we, we selected the top corridors based on multiple facts. Next slide. Then our field teams went out. Our, our field teams were some of the folks you see there um, on the screen, as well as our partners in Arizona Game and Fish. And they went out to the top locations, the top 10 crash hotspots and the top six wildlife corridors. So we went from the entire state. Now we started to go down to the specifics of where, where those locations were on the road. And then very specifically, where each culvert was um, in the, say, a hotspot or a corridor and where we could put potential new uh, wildlife crossing structures. So you can see um, we used a, a handheld, I should say on your phone, a um, survey one, ARC Survey 123 um, app that allowed the researchers to uh, put locations of where they saw something or where they think something should be changed and um, gave lots of input. So if you look on the left, it's kind of small, but Wherever the road cut through the landscape and it was above, the landscape was above the road were perfect places for overpasses. And then there's other places where underpasses were more appropriate. And we'll go through that uh, in more detail when we go through the projects. Next. Task four, we did a benefit cost analysis. And um, I'm just gonna just skim over that. It did not play into the selection of the crossing structures and what we did or what we chose. We, we wanted to give you the, the golden standard for every location. So we, we just gave you what we think the benefit cost analysis is for each one. Next on task five, we will tell you more about that when we talk about task seven. So on to task six is those of you there. We got, um, we got a lot of public involvement from 2020 to 2021. This is what this, this slide is about. Before we ever began our study, we sent notices um, to stakeholders. There were hard copy and uh, electronic notices to nonprofits, individuals, and the tribes. Public notices went out. We had eight public meetings planned, and we were lucky five of them did occur before COVID-19 shut down the state, basically. So you can see the, uh, the, the towns that we got to before then. There's been a website all along that people could go to to see what was going on and submit comments and an email address, which we did receive comments through. In 2021, we reached out to all the tribes to ask for more input for data and what they wanted to see and released the 2020 annual report. Next slide. In 20, 2021, we found out that 84 of you uh, gave us comments and we learned a lot from the tribes as well. There were over 30 comments and the top ones that we received was support for the plan, specific locations you want us to focus on, and then types of mitigation you think we should have done. Next slide. So now in 2022, this week, we are having our public meetings after releasing the plan um, a month ago. Comment period ends on March 12th. So if you'd like to tell us more about what you think or what you want us to look at or what you like or don't like, please let us know by March 12th at the website you'll see more about and uh, the email address and Matt, Matthew Haverland, who spoke earlier, he's at your point person. The input that we got from you, as well as our researchers and tribes and nonprofits, all went into the selection of the wildlife corridors. So we do wanna make it clear that the modeling that we showed you earlier that John Luke spoke about, those were linkages that were large scale over mountain ranges and very wide, miles wide. When the animals have to cross a road, that's when we call it a corridor, when it has to be very specific, much more narrow place. So the linkages got narrowed down to corridors in large part from all this information you see here. Next slide. So our top 
corridors and hotspots were based on the areas that we think we can best reduce wildlife vehicle collisions and where we can improve wildlife connectivity. Um, benefit costs came in later, but that did not factor in. And then, and then your, your input, and then of course, the adjacent land own, owners' um, willingness, of course, in the future, and then also if we've got some public lands. Next. So what we'd like to do now is tell you more about the top hotspots in the corridors, which you've been waiting for. So we'll go to the next slide. First, the top hotspot is Cuba in northern New Mexico, north of Cuba on US 550. The next hotspot is in Silver City, all roads leading to and through Silver City. The third top hotspot is Rodoso um, in the mountains there in the Sacramento Mountains, um, US 70 and I think New Mexico 48. The fourth hotspot is um, Glorieta Pass outside of Santa Fe um, on Interstate 25. And the fifth hotspot is Bent, which is down there in the Sacramento Mountains on US 70. So we'll go to the next slide and tell you more about the top corridors. We just love corridors and we know that that's really important to you. So we, we chose six of them to represent different geographic areas and also the different animal species that were our focal species. The number one wildlife corridor, it, corridor is in Chama. The number two one is just to the east of that um, in the Rio Grande del Norte National Monument. The third top corridor is going to be just south of Raton in what we call the Pronghorn Triangle, and we'll tell you more about that. Number four is the Peloncillo Mountains in I-10 in the boot heel. Number five is going to be the Sandia Jemez Mountains connection north of Albuquerque across Interstate 25. And number six is back up north again is Quested Red River um, in the mountains uh, just south of Colorado. So let's get into those projects and see what we've got there. All right, Cuba, US 550 north of Cuba. Our teams went in and they, and they wanted to locate this is hard to see, and that's why we encourage you, if you'd like to know the specifics, go ahead and get yourself a copy of the slideshow. In there, there are small icons. If you see blue, that's where we, uh, we would like to put an overpass. Elk will only use overpasses if in large numbers. You can get a bull elk to go underneath the road, but it's going to be hard to get that matriarchal cow and, and the 15th elk behind you to go through a culvert. So we're very much promoting overpasses for elk, which is the number one problem here in this hotspot. We're also, when you look at these, um, these 11 places, you look and see the public land is colored. So that purple there is uh, BLM and the green is Forest Service land. So we try to locate the crossing structures on public land. And then the green boxes um, that are squares or triangles are proposed underpasses. And the red ones are retrofits to existing structures, which typically means let's put some wildlife fence to get the animals to go under. So we've got a 17 mile, um, Hotspot here, and we have uh, lots of suggestions on what can be done, particularly on public land, but also with the Hickory Apache Nation. Next. The next hotspot is Silver City. Now, there's not a lot of things we can do in Silver City with all the private land and roads, so we want to retrofit the existing structures so that we put some fence there and get the deer to go underneath the road. When you get up to those areas on the outside, the outskirts, those finger roads coming into, in and out of Silver City, that's where we have more of an elk problem. We got a couple of um, over just two overpasses there that we suggest, and then a lot of bridges and culverts. Again, this is important. This is a lot of private land, so we'll be working with private landowners to see what we can get going. Number three is the Pronghorn Triangle. Oh, excuse me, Rodoso. I, I jumped there. That was the corridor. Um, the Rodoso hotspot, again, if you looked at, at that gray color for the land, a lot of private landowners. So we have very limited options on what we could do in the Rodoso area. We, we made some recommendations more on the outskirts of town and also on the Mescalera Apaches land. Mostly mule deer, but we do have some problems with elk. Next one is going to be the Glorieta Pass outside of Santa Fe. The traffic volume is so high here that we're really becoming, a, it's become a barrier to wildlife movements. Although wildlife are getting killed to the point this was a, a top 10 crash hotspot. So we're looking at uh, one overpass, which is up around, um, I think it's mile post 296, just, let's just make sure, yeah. And then the rest of it is retrofitting, quite a bit of it's retrofitting existing un underpasses to get the mule deer and bear um, underneath I-25. But again, it's going to take the work of um, working with private landowners. And we also think we should extend our efforts beyond that, that pink colored line that's only three miles. And next, the fifth, 
One is bent. This turned out to be the top crash hotspot when you look solely at crashes per mile per year. Bent is the totally elk problem area, which is very unusual in states. I work in other states as well, and we've never had a top hotspot be based on, on elk um, getting hit. So but again, when you look at this, we want to get elk over the road, not under the road in large numbers. And so we, we located an overpass right smack in the middle there on public land, a couple of retrofits and some new structures all the way out to the Mescalera Apache land. And after that, we've got the top six wildlife corridors. So let's get into them. Next slide will be the Chama Wildlife Corridor. Very long, um, Chama's 38 miles of roads and a lot of mule deer and elk live here and move throughout this valley up into the mountains and back and forth. And our friends at the Hickory Apache Nation, they did a great job of collaring with GPS collars, mule deer and elk for decades, decades of time. They've been able to document exactly where the animals are trying to cross the road. And if you look there, between Chama and to the west, you'll see um, green and, and blue places we know the elk are trying to cross. And we suggest wildlife crossing structures, particularly in conjunction with wildlife management areas. We've got a lot of suggestions there. Um, we work closely with the Hickory Nation to, to try and make sure we put structures where they thought they could help out as well. Again, we're gonna be relying on private landowners quite a bit. Next slide. Okay. The next one is Rio Grande del Norte National Monument Wildlife Corridor. Um, it's mostly on public land, so we have a lot of options here. We've got three species, as you see here, that are moving back and forth across 285. And there are collared animals that are showing us exactly where they need to cross, which helped um, show us exactly where we should be putting our structure. So we've got a couple of overpasses. We have a driver warning system here um, for times when the animals are crossing over and uh, a couple of underpasses. Next slide. Um, this is the pronghorn triangle. This is uh, quite a bit of roads um, south of Raton. We have Interstate um, 25 there, and it's a total of 69 miles of road, a lot, a lot of road. And our, our team went out and, and just, they were, did remarkable. They looked at um, over, over 60 different structures there. Um, so we suggest places where the pronghorn can get over the interstate, um, and then we want, and then we believe that they can get across some of these other roads, but they're very, I call them, I'll call them tender animals. They don't know they can jump um, fences typically. And when you wanna get a whole herd across the road, it's the only option is an overpass. So we made some very specific recommendations for the pronghorn in particular, but we do have elk, mule deer, and even black bear getting hit on these roads. Next slide. The next corridor is I-10 in the Blue Heel of New Mexico. Um, there's five mile stretch where we have amazing data. This is just, uh, this is a great story for a journalist if you're listening. New Mexico Game and Fish has collars on desert bighorn on the south side of the interstate and Arizona Game and Fish have collars on desert bighorn on the north side. So there's two different herds being monitored. And like Mark once said, they look like they're looking at each other from across the highway, but never have the two met that we know of. None of the collared animals have any indication that they actually cross the interstate. So very big divider, not just for desert bighorn, but for wide, wide ranging species that wanna move between states and nations. And we thought this was an important connection. And the next wildlife crossing area is the San Diego Mez Mountains Wildlife Corridor. This is north of Albuquerque and north of Bernalillo. Oh, our, our partners in Pueblo Santa Ana were amazing. They were able to collar all five species you see there on, on tribal lands. And those animals moved and showed us exactly where they needed to cross. Then our colleagues over at the University of New Mexico gave us collar data for mountain lions. And they came up from the south on the Sandia Mountains and show us where they needed to cross. Then our, um, our friends in nonprofits in the area also showed us how uh, the crest of Montezuma was an important wildlife connection as well. So. This was definitely a shoe in for a major wildlife corridor that needed protection, not only on I-25, but if you look, um, US 550 that goes to the Northwest Bernalillo is also a place that we need to, um, we can retrofit a bunch of structures by putting fence to them and putting some crossing structures. And the um, this Pueblo of Santa Ana is very willing to work with us on that. And the next one, <clears throat> last but not least is the Cuesta Wildlife Corridor. It goes from Cuesta to Red River on New Mexico 38 in the very northern part of the state. This one is very much dedicated to just Rocky Mountain bighorn. 
Um, and again, they're another animal that's very tender, I'll say, but they, they, they won't, you, you can't get a herd of bighorn to go underneath the road. You, they need overpasses as well. Again, when you look at these, the three species that are the, the toughest to get across roads, bighorn, pronghorn, and elk. You can get the big boys to go under, but you can't get the matriarchal females and the young of the year under. So typically you need to get overpasses. And this is experience on nearby states um, that we, myself and um, other members of the team have uh, researched. And next, that is your New Mexico's top 11 crash hotspots and wildlife corridors for your wildlife action plan. Thank you. All right, thank you, Patty. Excellent job summarizing a ton of information. Uh, so we will continue accepting comments until March 12th. Uh, once we receive all those comments, we will compile them and discuss them and make uh, up, updates or changes to the plan as needed. Uh, we, we don't want you to worry about not getting your comments in by March 12th because we do have the opportunity to update the plan on an annual basis. So feel free to submit your comments or questions to the email address uh, provided on the website. And I can also enter that in the chat later on. So after we uh, accept all the comments, we will release the final uh, version of the plan this spring. Uh, like I said, we can update it on, a, on an annual basis. Uh, once we do that, we will take the next step, next step which is uh, pursue funding options. And uh, this will be a a very big challenge for us uh, as the, the act itself does not actually dedicate funding to these projects. But we will explore every avenue of funding. There are a lot of options. There are a lot of uh, potential partner groups to work with. There is a, a new federal uh, infrastructure bill that dedicates $350 million specifically for uh, wildlife crossing projects. And so we will be on top of all of that. Uh, next slide, please. So here's uh, some contact information for you. Uh, this is a website, which I think is also provided on uh, our Facebook page, uh, DOT's Facebook page, as well as uh, numerous uh, uh, press releases that you, you may have seen. Uh, this is a good contact email address, but you can also contact us uh, by this, uh, the, the cell phone number you see at the, the bottom there, or you can write to the address you just want to send a good old fashioned handwritten letter. Uh, and with that, we'll open the floor to questions or comments.